So we're gonna finish up our learning about magnetism. And we're going to see inductors in circuits. So remember an inductor is another word for inductor is like a solenoid. And so in the circuit, we draw, I draw a solenoid like this. So remember the way that a solenoid works is that if there is a current going through the wire like this, then it will generate a magnetic field that points this way. So what does it look like when we put one of these things inside of a circuit? So we'll start with a direct current circuit. So this is called an RL circuit. And so the R is for resistor, the L is for inductor. And so for a direct current RL circuit, you would just get something like this. So we have this resistor and maybe I'll add, I'll add a switch in here. So at, so this will be what it looks like at time equals zero. And then at some later time, T1, will describe what is going on in the circuit. Resistor R, inductor L. Okay, so let's. So when you first turn it on, the inductor acts like a brake. In the circuit, 
And so you could imagine just like there's no path that the current can take to go around the circuit. So your circuit doesn't really work. And then after some amount of time, which would depend on the inductance, the inductor acts like a wire. So then the final picture would be just a resistor hooked up to a battery. And so the reason for this has to do with Ampere's law and Lenz's law that we've seen previously. So if you imagine we've hooked up an inductor to a battery, and let's say there's a switch here. So right when we close the switch, the current The current through the inductor increases so the magnetic field for a solenoid is this equation where this is the permeability of free space. This is the turn density or the number of loops divided by the length of the solenoid. And then I is the current. And this is the magnetic field of the solenoid. But now we're increasing the magnetic field. So if we think about Ampere's law, we can get a voltage by having a changing magnetic flux. And because the current in our system is changing, because when you close the switch, it takes some time for the circuit to reach its maximum current then we would get some induced voltage and therefore an induced current in the solenoid that's governed by this equation. And then you have to multiply this by N because the solenoid has N loops. But this is 
Ampere's law slash slash lens law. So because the current in the solenoid is changing, that's going to induce a current in the opposite direction of the direction that the current is flowing from the battery. So you get an induced current. So let's say that the original current was flowing this way. You would get an induced current I induced going the opposite direction. So if your induced current is pointing to the right, then you would get a magnetic field that counteracts the original direction of the current. So due to ampere slash lenses law. There is an induced current in the opposite direction to the direction of current. flowing from the power supply. So you turn on your circuit because the current in the circuit is increasing, you get a an induced current in the opposite direction due to Ampere and Lenz's law. And so that current in the opposite direction is fighting against the current that is present just from the battery being in the system. So this is why when you turn on a circuit with an inductor in it, the inductor originally acts like a break in the circuit because it's fighting the change, the increasing current in your circuit when you turn on or like when you close that switch. Then after a while, your current will reach its maximum value. Then there's no longer a change in current. So there's no longer an induced voltage or an induced current. And so then your solenoid or inductor just goes back to acting like a piece of wire. So then if we go back to this picture. We'll Take a look at what happens if I close this red switch so that we kind of remove the the volt uh, the power supply from the circuit and just leave the inductor and the resistor hooked up together. So now. Now we close the switch here. So we remove the voltage from the circuit or the battery from the circuit. And we'll call that time t equals zero. And we'll see what the circuit looks like at the beginning and then 
at some later time. So now we've had the, the current reached its max power or its max uh, value. And so the inductor was just acting like a piece of wire. And then we switch, we flip the switch. So now we remove the current from, or the voltage supply from the circuit. And now we wanna see what happens. So when we flip the switch, the inductor, resists, or maybe so if we so when we had the the red switch connecting to the battery, it had some current. And then when we flip the switch now, that current is going to start decreasing, right? So it was at a max value. And if you turn off the power supply, for example, then your current is gonna decrease to zero. The inductor doesn't like changes to the current. So when you flip the switch, the inductor is now going to have a a decreasing current flowing through it. So if it has a decreasing current flowing through it, that means that the magnetic flux through the solenoid is changing. You have a changing magnetic flux, that means that you have an induced current. So now, even though I'm no longer hooked up to the battery, because the inductor has a decreasing current loop through it, it has a decreasing magnetic flux. That magnetic flux will then induce a current in the circuit, even though it's no longer attached to the power supply. And so this is happening immediately when you flip the switch and it will go on for a little while until the current in the system reaches zero. And so then at some later time, the, the, the so I guess maybe initially you can think of the, the circuit as looking like a voltage hooked up to the resistor. So when it's just, so when I flip the switch, the solenoid starts acting like a battery basically. And then at some later time, there's no longer a changing current in your system. And so the inductor goes back to acting like a wire. <laughs> 
So you can draw some parallels to capacitors and RC circuits, and I'll do that on the next slide. So let's compare. RC circuits and RL circuits. And so I'll call it charging and then discharging. And then we'll have time equals zero and time equal infinity. So we just saw for an inductor, when you first turn on your power supply, the inductor acts like a break in your circuit. And then after you let the power supply be on for a little bit, then the inductor goes to acting like a wire. And then when we remove the battery from the system, uh, for a little while, the inductor acts like a battery and is providing some current flow to the circuit. And then at some later time, the Inductor runs out of a changing current, and so there's no longer an induced current going through it. So the inductor just acts like a wire again. So now let's think back to our C circuits. So when you first start charging a capacitor, so basically at t equals zero, your capacitor acts like a wire. And then after you let the capacitor charge for a while, it will reach its maximum charge. And then it acts like a break in your circuit. Then if you disconnect the power supply from the circuit, then your capacitor can act like a battery. And then at some later time, your capacitor just goes back to having no charge, so. Maybe instead of saying it acts like a wire, I'll just say it. No more charge on capacitor. So no current. And then here, there's no more changing current. on the inductor, and so there's no induced current. <laughs> 
and it's so good. So for, I guess the takeaway is for the discharging, the capacitor and the inductor work pretty, they achieve the same goals, but in different ways. They act like a power supply to your circuit, but then when they're charging, they act in the opposite way. So when you charge a capacitor, it initially just acts like a wire. And then after the capacitor has reached its maximum charge, then it acts like a break in your circuit. And inductors are the opposite. So inductors initially act like a break in your circuit. And then after the current has been on for a while, then the inductor goes back to acting like a wire. Then in kind of in words to summarize all of this. So for an inductor, inductors resist changes in current. in the circuit. So if there's any like definition that will kind of help you remember all of what we just talked about, it, it would be this one. And so that applies to when you first turn on the circuit because you're increasing the current in the circuit. So your inductor doesn't want that. So it creates a current in the opposite direction to fight it. And then when you remove your battery from the circuit and it's just the inductor, now you've taken away the current. So your current is gonna be decreasing. Your inductor doesn't want that. So it induces a current in the circuit to try to compensate for that lost current. And eventually it, it won't be able to do that anymore. And then it'll go back to back to the wire. So that was all talking about direct current uh, circuits. So now we'll talk about alternating currents, which is what we use mostly in like pretty much every other application besides, well, I guess that's not true. So most of the power that's delivered is alternating current and some devices will just run on alternating current and then some devices will change the alternating current into direct current and then power the device using direct current. So, but there are devices that work on alternating current. And so we need to understand those circuits. So the symbol for the voltage in a direct current circuit is this. So this is a DC voltage. And so for an AC circuit, it's a circle with a squiggly line through it. And so just like you can have resistors, capacitors, and inductors in direct current circuits, you can also have those things in alternating current circuits. So a resistor acts, so let's do, so a resistor is gonna act the same 
in DC and AC circuits. An inductor is going to act differently. And so we just saw how they act in DC currents or DC circuits which is what we were talking about a minute ago. And in AC circuits, we have this thing called reactants. And so the reactants for an inductor I guess. So reactance is, you can think about it as the, as being equivalent or the, maybe the analog to resistance in AC circuit. So if you have a resistor hooked up to a DC power supply or an AC power supply, you can just use the value of the resistance. If you have an inductor in a DC power supply, you just use the value of the inductor. But if it's hooked up to an AC power supply, you have to use this thing called reactants. And the reactance for an inductor is 2 pi F L, where F is the frequency of the alternating current. And another way that you might see this written is just omega L, where omega is the angular frequency. And then for a capacitor, they also act differently. In AC versus DC circuits. And for alternating current, they have, they also have a reactance and it's equal to one over two pi F times C for the capacitance. Or again, you can rewrite that using the angular frequency omega times C. And so maybe I'll draw all this. I'll leave this and I'll draw that on the next slide. So any question about the equations uh, that you would use? And I'll show you how they're used in a moment. So let's quickly go back to, so DC circuits versus AC circuits. So for DC circuits, your if you plot the current versus time, oh, backwards, time on the x-axis, then the current would just be a straight line that doesn't change. And then for alternating current circuits, you're gonna get some kind of sine function or cosine, uh, 
So you could start at zero and then go up to some max current and then go back down and alternate like that. And so if you know the period of this, so the period would be the time that it takes to go from peak to peak, then the frequency is just one over that period or period is one over frequency. So usually you'll just be given the frequency of the alternating current, uh, like 120 Hertz or 240 Hertz, something like that. And Hertz is just one Hertz is uh, one over one second or 60 Hertz is equal to one over 60 seconds. So that's, those are DC versus AC circuits, what the current looks like. And so that's why, if you think about how inductors and capacitors work, it makes sense that they would operate differently in an AC circuit versus a DC circuit. So uh, we said that inductors like to resist changes in current in the circuit, well, in an AC circuit, the current is constantly changing. And so the inductor is constantly going to be doing something to fight the current. And so it's going to act like a resistor does. So a resistor also kind of, it doesn't necessarily fight the current, but it eventually it will like if you just had a resistor hooked up to a power supply, the resistor is would get hot and it would start losing energy in your system. And so uh, inductors and capacitors start working like resistors when they're in an alternating current circuit. And so that's why you need the reactances when you're dealing with those elements in a circuit. Okay, so we saw that reactants look like this. And then impedance, so impedance is represented by the capital letter Z. Impedance is how we take into account if there are resistors, capacitors, and inductors in a circuit together. So the impedance, and a circuit is the square root of R squared plus the reactance from an inductor minus the reactance for a capacitor. Oop, that square is in one spot. There. And so the unit on impedance is ohms. And you can see that, right? So let's say there's only resistance. So that would mean that the, there's no inductance or capacitance. 
So then you would just get z equals r squared, which would go to z equaling r. And then you can do the same thing if there's only capacitor, then you would just get z equals xc only an inductor, you would get Z equals XL. And then you can do any other combination you want. Like if you had just resistor and inductor, or maybe I'll do resistor and capacitor first, then you would get Z equal square root of R squared plus xc squared and then in an rl circuit you will get z equals square root r squared plus xl squared And there's not, for the most part, resistors or your circuit's always going to have resistance because even just wires have a small resistance to them. So for the most part, you're always going to have R squared plus something. Resonance. In RLC circuits, so when you put resistors, inductors, and capacitors into the same circuit, uh, you can get something interesting to happen. So if you remember, way back here, we said that capacitors would act like a wire when they first start charging, and inductors would act like a brake. But then after a while, inductors would act like a wire and capacitors would act like a brake. So you'll get this feedback between those two things. And they will start, the current in your circuit will oscillate like a, so a harmonic oscillator, which we've seen examples of, like a pendulum that swings back and forth. Um, or a, a mass on a spring, in the same way you get a resonance in RLC circuits. So if you look at, oh, that's what I wanted to show. Uh, so just as an aside, in DC circuits, you have V equals IR and power equals IV. Or maybe we'll just do Ohm's law for, for now. So in AC circuits, we can just replace the R with the impedance Z. So if we do that, now we get, and let's say we want to solve for I, then we would get V over Z. And if you want to maximize your current, you want to minimize the impedance. In order to minimize the impedance, you want the thing under the square root to be a minimum. And that occurs when XL equals XC. So if you set those two things equal to each other, omega L equals, oh, uh, yeah, equals one over omega C. 
if you solve for omega, and I'll put a zero underneath of it for the subscript, you'll get this equation. And so this omega zero is special because this is the resonant frequency. I guess this is technically the angular, resonant angular frequency. And so just like with the pendulum, you get a resonant frequency that's based on the length of the pendulum, or for a mass spring system, you get a resonant frequency that's based on the mass and the spring constant in an RLC circuit or LRC circuit. You also get a resonant frequency, and that resonant frequency is just these one over the square root of the inductance times the capacitance. And so in lab tomorrow, we'll do stuff with LRC circuits, and you'll be able to see this phenomenon first thing.